morning. All right, it's 8 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have Dr. Ambadi, one of our uh, faculty members, who's going to be giving grand rounds today. And all of us know that Dr. Ambadi was doing things at, it, at young ages that when we weren't even thinking about important things in life. Um, but he, he's sort of past that stage in his life. So it's been, it's been almost 20 years since he graduated from medical school. 18. 18 years. We don't want to add more. Um, but he does great work here at the Moran Eye Center on, on the research and the clinical side of things. And he's going to talk to us about some of his uh, research and clinical applications of that. So Dr. Ambadi. Um, thanks. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get it. Yeah, I'll figure it. Um, so appreciate all of you coming in early this morning. Um, when my uh, brother and I both decided to do ophthalmology, uh, for a few minutes we were thinking about uh, specializing in the right eye versus the left eye. <laughs> but we decided front and back work better instead. So that'll be the theme of uh, today's um, talk. And um, actually, it's going to be two completely different talks. So um, I'm hoping to finish the retina research part in half an hour and the clinical cornea part in half an hour. But I do uh, invite questions and, um, and discussion. So um, as most of you know, I, about half my time is over on the fifth floor in the, in the, uh, on the research side. And but what I'd like to um, share with you today is some of our work over the last 11 years that um, hopefully will be translational in nature. And all of you, or the vast majority of you in this audience, have seen this slide uh, more times than you care to admit, probably, where the corneal avascularity is mediated by a substance called soluble flit, which binds VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Those of you who have been here in Derek Holt's years have uh, uh, seen this on more than one occasion. And I promise I'm not going to talk about Raver 2 today. Um, but the reason I laid this out is it's important uh, for the rest of the talk to just bear in mind the basic dictionary, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, mediates abnormal blood vessel formation in the eye. VEGF receptors include membrane-bound PLIT1 as well as soluble PLIT1, which is a VEGF antagonist. It's a soluble receptor. So it's hanging out in, in the interstitial space, sucking up VEGF. So um, we showed several years ago that it's vital to the cornea to express this molecule. Now, how does that apply to the retina? Well, in the back of the eye, um, there's also vascular demarcations, which are breached in macular degeneration. You have uh, choroidal neovascularization that grows subretinally and which can bleed and destroy vision. And um, angiogenesis in general affects so many different parts of the eye and so many different diseases. So this is an important problem. And it's a very prevalent problem. In the US alone, there are as many people, if not more, with macular degeneration than all cancers put together. OK, so that's the perspective. s foot one we established, was expressed in the cornea. And over the last five years, with the help of the eye bank, and um, as well as uh, collaborators from around the country, we found that it's also expressed in the retina. It's stained in, um, do I just get a pointer? On an RNA level, it's stained in purple in both the photoreceptors and in the RPE. On a protein level, it's stained here in red in multiple layers of the retina. And if you focus on the RPE, it's pretty highly expressed in the retinal pigment epithelium. In contrast, in macular degeneration specimens, it's pretty much absent in the RPE, both in CNV uh, specimens from human eyes that were donated after death, as well as in retinal angiomatous proliferation eyes 
uh, in its action to the photoreceptor layer. So this is just circumstantial evidence that S-Quirk is absent in macular degeneration specimens. Take that over to the lab side. If you inject anti-FLT1 um, antibody subretinally in a mouse, and uh, the first year residents have gotten very good at intravitreal injections in people, and I uh, invite any of you who want to test their microsurgical skills to uh, come uh, try to do some subretinal injections in mice, and uh, that will hone your skills very quickly. What happens is knockdown of FLT1 with an antibody subretinally induces VEGF and CMV as opposed to a control antibody. And if you do fluorescein angiography and OCT in a mice, we have the same spectralis instrument that's used on the clinical side. We have a mouse rig for it on the research side downstairs, you'll observe that we induce CMV that's much larger than anything induced with a an an control antibody injection. And this is confirmed on OCT evaluation. So that's knockdown of FLT1 at a protein level. We can then proceed deeper in the pathway by knocking it down at an mRNA level. We can express using an adeno-associated virus, an AAV. It's very similar to what's used in clinical trials in labor's congenital amaurosis or other diseases to express a short hairpin RNA, a type of RNA, a double-stranded RNA that targets selective genes. Now, if you recall back to medical school, mRNA is single-stranded. Double-stranded RNA occurs in viruses. And double-stranded RNA is a signal for cells to destroy gene transcripts because double-stranded RNA is normally not present in eukaryotic cells. We can take advantage of this by expressing a double-stranded RNA, a short hairpin RNA, a hairpin it forms a double strand. We can trick a cell into destroying the s flit mRNA. And when you do that, you knock down s flit one we would predict VEGF would be released, and that would induce neovascularization. Now, does that happen? Indeed, it does. So we can knock down s flit one protein, and this correlates very nicely with expression on staining, most importantly with C and V formation on fluorescent angiography and on histology. And we can quantify this. VEGF is increased as is coital neovascular volume compared to any of the controls. So we've knocked down FLT1 on a protein level. We've knocked down s foot one on an mRNA level. And can we knock it down on a gene level? And I'll get to that in just a moment. I just wanted to show briefly what these uh, spectralis images look like on the mouse. Let's see if we can play this. We can get pretty high quality resolution even in the mouse eye, and you can see the CMV lesion distorting the entire mouse retina. Okay. So the third arm of this process was genomic knockdown of FLT1 using what's called the Prelox system. So how does the Prelox work? Okay. You can uh, obtain a transgenic mouse that has the FLT1 gene flanked by what are called LOXP flanking sequences. And if you insert an enzyme called clear recombinase, that will excise FLT1 from the gene. So it removes a target gene from the chromosome. If you inject a plasmid that expresses CRE enzyme into this transgenic FLT1 LOXP animal. We do, of course, knock down a FLT1 expression. Hey, Brad. Um, and uh, um, induce CMV and induce CMV that's uh, observed in fluorescein angiography in the mouse. Now, all of the models I've shown you so far have involved the subretinal injection process. Okay. Now, a criticism that you could throw at me would be, 
Well, subretinal injection is not a good uh, test. You're damaging the retina with your needle no matter how good your injector is. And that's a fair criticism. So how do we get around that? I've knocked down protein, I've knocked down mRNA, I've knocked down genes, all using a subretinal injection delivery system. Well, one way we can get around that is to take advantage of this transgenic animal. The way we can do that is develop new transgenic animals. Now, there are other transgenics that express Cree in selective areas of the retina. So, on the left-hand side is a mouse that expresses red fluorescent protein known as Rosa, um, throughout every cell in its body. So if you, it's a, it will be a great Christmas present for if any of you have a six or eight year old son, uh, a mouse that glows red in the dark. That's that mouse. It glows red in the dark, it does. It's <laughs> <laughs> Don't wanna know. Um, If you mate that with uh, another mouse that expresses VMD Cree, now if you recall VMD, uh, the telophore macular dystrophy, that's an RPE specific gene. And this is a Cree enzyme driven by this RPE specific gene. We can observe this Cree expression shown in green just in the RPE. If you mate this red glow in the dark animal, with a different transgenic <coughs> called iCree75, we can induce Cree just in the photoreceptor layer. So that Cree enzyme that I showed can excise particular genes, we no longer have to inject subretinally. We can get the animal to express it either in the photoreceptors or in the RPE. So that drives our next experiment. We can mate that VMD Cree animal with that split locks animal, so we get a new transgenic resulting in selective knockdown of flit just in the RPE. Or you can mate ICRI-75 with the flit locks animal and knock down flit just in the photoreceptor layer. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so we're knocking down S flit 1 just in the photoreceptors or just in the RPE compared to control transgenic animals. And when we do that, CNV occurs spontaneously in the VMD Cree flintlocks animal. Recall this is where S flint 1 is reduced just in the RPE. And this is confirmed on OCT, fluorescent angiography, and on electron microscopy. Conversely, if you made it with the iCree 75 foot locks animal, very interesting lesions. You don't get CNV, but you get these neovascular lesions in the inner retina at the border with the outer retina, which remind us of RAP lesions, ret retinal angiomatous proliferation. So CNV is the most common form of AMD where the subretinal angiogenesis is growing up from the cord, and then in RAP you have inner retinal vessels growing <coughs> down into the photoreceptor layer. So essentially what we believe we're observing is induction spontaneously without any injection of CNV or RAP. Okay, so that's what we've shown so far. Knocking down this foot protein at the protein level, mRNA level, or DNA level induces different phenotypes of AMD. Who cares? Why does that matter? Okay. So the second um, branch of our uh, research effort is on developing therapies where hopefully we can knock down VEGF intracellularly. Avastin, Lucentis, Ilea, all of these wonderful drugs that have made a difference, all of those are anti-VEGFs that bind VEGF outside of cells. However, many vascular endothelial cells express their own VEGF and their own VEGF receptors. 
So imagine trying to do a drug interdiction project when the junkie is the cocaine. Right? If you have your own receptor and growth factors, it is often very difficult to disrupt those autocrine loops by an extracellular treatment. So how can we attack VEGF intracellularly? Okay, for that, um, we borrowed a page from our friends in the HIV literature. And uh, uh, David Baltimore and colleagues, uh, about 15 or 18 years ago, did a very nice experiment where if you couple stromal derived factor with a four amino acid peptide called KDEL, which serves as a retention signal for the endophosphate reticulum, what you develop is a SDF KDEL recombinant that stays in the endophosphate reticulum. All proteins are expressed in the endophosphate reticulum. Now the receptor that binds SDF is CXCR4. And what they were able to show is that this recombinant protein, SDF KDEL, sequestered CXCR4, kept it from ever getting to the cell surface in macrophages. And by doing that, they could keep these macrophages and the mice with these uh, treated uh, with, with this drug treatment from getting HIV. CXCR4 is a very important receptor for HIV entry, and by knocking down its expression, you can, by, by this uh, intracellular sequestration, you can prevent HIV entry. And they call that an intracellular chemokine or an intrakine. Why is that important? Well, in Ghana and certain other places, there are uh, certain populations of humans that are CXO4 knockouts, people who don't have this gene, and they're resistant to AIDS no matter what they do. Now, getting back on track with our work, we sought to knock down VEGF by developing an intracellular receptor as opposed to an intracellular chemokine. So in a cartoon model, we have VEGF receptors that are hanging out in the cells. VEGF binds, and that leads to signal transduction inside cells. We propose to make a VEGF receptor that would have that KDEL sequence, that four amino acid endoplasmic reticulum attention signal, which would keep the receptor within the ER and also sequester VEGF within the ER, thereby <coughs> disrupting intracellular uh, production and release of VEGF. Now, about eight years ago, we did experiments in a mouse corneal injury model. And uh, this is where you can put sodium hydroxide on the surface of a mouse eye and induce aggressive neovascularization, which progresses over time. But in treated eyes, we can regress neovascularization. So we can prevent aggressive KMV and while the cornea is not clear, we can make all those vessels go away. Now, can we achieve relevance to the retina? And why would we, why is there relevance to the retina? Now, no offense to Paul or Emmy or Al, um, I would submit to you that our retina clinics look like this, <laughs> where we have patients coming in again and again and again. Um, for their intravitreal injections. I don't think our patients like this. I don't think our doctors like this. It is the best that we have to offer, but um, we should do better. So um, in the lab, what we've been developing are these nanoparticles that are biodegradable. PLGA is a polymer that degrades to lactic acid and glycolic acid. Those are degraded by the uh, Krebs cycle, and this nanoparticle contains the plasmids that express our interceptors against VEGF, PLGA is that biodegradable polymer, and this is studded with a peptide called RGD. And RGD is a homing peptide. It allows selective guidance just to abnormal new blood vessels. So rather than uh, carpet bombing an area, it's more of a guided missile. It homes just to abnormal blood vessels and stays away from normal blood vessels. And the way it does that 
is it homes to alpha V beta three integrin, which is part of the molecular signature of, of neural vessel uh, tissue beds. It's not expressed in normal blood vessels. Alpha V beta three is selective to growing new blood vessels. And we first showed in 2009 in a pilot study that these nanoparticles, when injected by tail vein into a rat that sustained laser-induced uh, choroidal neovascularization, if all of you know if you shoot an argon laser too hot or too long into a person's retina, you can break Brooks membrane and, and induce CNV. And you can do the same thing in a mouse or a rat and induce CNV. Um, you have the CNV lesion breaking uh, Brooks and entering the retina. When you treat these rats with RGD-coded Bertuccio K nanoparticles, you can suppress the CNV lesions relative to any of the controls. And uh, naked plasmids, nanoparticles without plasmids, or untargeted nanoparticles. We then followed up over the last few years in both mouse and monkey models. In that mouse model where I showed you we could knock down split with that double-stranded RNA, we can regress CNV over the course of a month, as opposed to control animals, which actually develop secondary lesions due to this uh, knockdown of S-split. In, in a quantified fashion, relative to any of the controls, the treatment is the only one that's able to shrink CNV. And this is uh, just a higher mag view, CNV lesion in a mouse. Four weeks after injection, it's almost completely gone. This is just one particular mouse, but this effect was statistically significant. I told you that the RGD nanoparticles were selective. <coughs> and to give proof of that, if you take a mouse eye that has a CNV lesion, you can label these nanoparticles with Nile red, and on high mag, you can see those Nile red particles in the CNV lesion, but not in the unaffected retina, and not in a healthy eye after systemic injection. Separate model, laser model of CNV, we observe a very similar effect. CNV we can regress with our treatment much more than any of the controls. Confirmed on pathology where our CNV lesion is much bigger in a control animal than in the treated animal. How does this compare to um, avastin? Well, you can't really use avastin in a mouse because avastin is humanized, but there are anti-mouse anti-VEGF antibodies, which are essentially um, <coughs> the correlate of avastin in the mirroring model. And we didn't observe a statistically significant difference, but there's a trend that this RGD treatment is better. But it's not statistically significant, but certainly it's not inferior to intra vitro anti-VEGF injections. Can you test a vision? Well, you can't stick a mouse in front of a, a Snellen chart. Um, but I can steal from Judith and use the optokinetic uh, nystagmus model. Um, if you stick a person in front of a series of graded stripes that move, their eyes beep. And you can do the same thing to a mouse. You can stick a mouse in a drum, keep the mouse from escaping, and this mouse has to see this series of black and white stripes moving. And the thinner the stripe, if the mouse can track, the better the mouse can see. Um, normal mouse acuity is about, uh, in an untreated, unlasered animal, by this test is about 0.38 cycles per degree. That's a normal mouse. When you treat it um, and induce CNV, it falls down to the 0.3 range, 0 0.28, 0 0.3 range. 
we can restore much of that with treatment with our targeted nanoparticles that regress CMV, and none of the controls in DU is a statistically significant improvement. So unlike any of the control populations, our treatment can indeed restore not all, but some visual function in a mouse. Okay, mice are nice. Do mice really matter? Let's look at monkeys. Okay. We can induce laser CNV in a monkey, and the monkey eye uh, resembles the human eye much more. And in a control animal, treated with buffer, the CNV spots get worse over time in all the control groups, whether treated with PDS buffer, blank nanoparticles, or untargeted nanoparticles. The CNV spots over time get worse. However, when we treat the monkey with RGB targeted for 2,3K nanoparticles, we can actually induce regression of CNV. And this is confirmed on, on uh, immunofluorescence where control animals have much more uh, vascularization uh, shown in red and fibrosis shown in green. Polycan is a fibrosis <laughs> marker, collagen one is a vascular marker. And on pathology, where the monkey CMV lesions are considerably larger in the control than in the treated animals. And so we're able to regress both CMV and fibrosis in a statistically significant fashion relative to all controls. Why is any of this important? And I submit to you that in uh, this month's ophthalmology, the way the 7-Up trial uh, is, is published, that over the next several decades, we're going to have a serious problem. Anti-VEGF therapy administered to AMD patients for seven years, almost two-thirds, three-fifths of them develop subretinal macular fibrosis, and 90% of them develop foveal atrophy. Um, Paul and Emmy and others will know better than I, but what I recall from the MPS studies uh, in the 80s is that this is much higher rates of fibrosis and atrophy with anti-VEGF therapy than natural history of AMD. So while anti-VEGF therapy is a boon to new vascular AMD, there are significant costs over the long term. And if we can develop therapies, Paul? I was asking if they see that, because I had written Honestly, that. we don't see it. Okay. It's really not that. And plus, the other thing about the curve is they see, they develop fibrosis in each of these uh, particles. Again, I haven't read the seven up, so I just didn't think that they uh, did that theory. But in fact, Fair enough. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. This yeah. just came out um, in November, in the November issue of ophthalmology, so I'd really welcome your thoughts on it once you get a ch chance yeah, to review it. But assuming this is true, um, and this was a fairly large cohort, um, then I think it is important to, de to develop an anti-VEGF therapy that is targeted, that is not globally suppressive of VEGF in the retina, because VEGF is not just vascular growth factor, it is also a neurotrophic agent. Photoreceptors deprived of VEGF do, uh, and ganglion cells, um, do suffer. Um, I think that's the relevance of targeted therapy. So um, <coughs> you might ask if you administer these nanoparticles systemically, are there systemic side effects? Uh, in mice, in monkeys, in rats, we did not observe any. Uh, indeed, we did not observe any uh, nanoparticle deposition in kidney, lung, skin, or liver, all of which are high vascular flow beds. Um, so in summary, these targeted nanoparticles enhance selective localization, regress fibrosis, improve vision, um, and may in the future serve as an alternative or adjunct to monthly intravitreal injections. So to wrap up, what I've shown you in this first talk is that understanding the basis for vascular zoning can serve as the basis for a novel 
non-viral gene therapy delivered by top, uh, targeted nanoparticles to the rest of the entity. So um, I've just taken the credit for 10 years worth of work by a lot of different people um, and uh, funded by uh, several agencies that we're very grateful for. And uh, <coughs> any questions on Uh, Novartis has asked us to test it in their models, so we'll see what comes of that. We'll, um, we'll see where it goes. Paul? I wish Meg were here. Um, uh, Meg has some interesting data. I don't think she's published on it yet, but uh, Meg does have some SNP data on some uh, foot variants. Um, all right, with that, we'll completely switch gears. Now that the back of the eye people 